Uh, in this webinar, we're going to be looking a little bit more into what the difference is between NaniML Cloud and NaniML Open Source, and which one is the most optimal solution for you. Um, we have prepared a small agenda. We're going to start with the beginning, why we need ML monitoring, um, why NaniML, and then we're going to compare NaniML Cloud versus NaniML Open Source. Also give a little bit of history of why we built the open source, what's the vision behind it, and why we're building NaniML Cloud and where we want to go uh, with both of these products. And then I will give, I will get very practical and I will give you a walkthrough of the NaniML open source library. Uh, and I'll also do a quick walkthrough of the NaniML cloud product. Uh, and maybe to start uh, from the beginning, why do we need uh, ML model monitoring? Well, the first thing, uh, the first question we need to ask ourselves is, can we actually trust our machine learning models in production? And there has been this research that have been published. And if you've been following us for a while, it's really really talk a lot about this research actually, uh, but it's it's from MIT, Harvard uh, and Harvard. And what they basically did is they analyzed a bunch of data sets where they built models in um, and they saw how those models behaved over time. It's something that they called AI aging. And apparently 91% of those models in that experimental setup deteriorated over time. And also anecdotally, we know that when we deploy a machine learning model in the first six months, around 20% of the generated value of that model might be at risk due to covariate shift or concept shift, uh, new patterns emerging and old patterns becoming obsolete. So unfortunately, we cannot uh, trust our machine learnings blindly in production. Um, but why should we care that we can trust them? Um, I put out some scary headlines here just as a reminder what can happen if your machine learning models fail? Uh, and of course, there is always the, the Zillow use case um, where they made lots of mistakes with a house pricing prediction model. Um, and as data scientists, we're typically very deep inside of the data and building our machine learning models. And sometimes we just forget what's at stake because typically we're like analyzing lots of processes and we're actually making predictions and also impacting people's lives. So there is lots of stake, uh, lots at stake. And that's why it's very important to care about how our machine learning models are making decisions and whether those decisions are actually correct. Um, why is AI model uh, failure inevitable? Uh, sometimes we get this question, yeah, but the AI doesn't it train themselves uh, and doesn't it automatically update itself as well? And unfortunately, AI is not that smart. We're not in this world yet where things are self-supervised. And um, if you look at it from a data science perspective, what we have to do with the historical data um, in terms of data preparation, data formatting, data collection, uh, and, and getting examples and target data to learn from, it's actually lots of effort before an algorithm can learn something from it. Uh, and then when it gets deployed, it's actually a natural process because the uh, algorithms today are, are just trained on historical data and there's new patterns that are gonna be emerging and old patterns is gonna, gonna get obsolete. Um, and the AI model, it's just actually bound to make uh, mistakes eventually. Uh, so these things are, are two very important takeaways that AI is unfortunately not that smart uh, and that model failure itself, it's a natural process and that it's um, gonna happen eventually. Um, what's ML monitoring then? ML monitoring is the continuous oversight of machine learning models in production to ensure that they keep performing as expected. And the performance is really key here. Um, and that's actually also what we do with NaniML. We really focus on keeping machine learning models performant post-deployment. And that's also why we call ourselves more of a post-deployment data science company than actually a model monitoring company, uh, because there is way more things to be done um, post-deployment than just model monitoring. Um, and model monitoring is just basically the, the first gateway to doing proper um, post-deployment data science. And that's why, of course, that's where we start. And typically there's two types of machine learning models, uh, model monitoring, also because there's two uh, failure modes. Basically the first one is that the model fails to make predictions. Um, this might be due to errors or resource constraints or the code might not be running um, or, in, or infrastructure wise. And then there is the model's predictions that fail. Um, and this is typically when a model makes an actual mistake in the sense of the, the prediction being wrong uh, and the accuracy of the performance metric uh, going down. And it's very important 
uh, to keep this in mind because today with the current state of uh, model monitoring, these two concepts are actually fairly separated. And the reason why they're separated is because um, who's responsible for model monitoring? Typically today with the current state of data science and MLOps engineering and ML engineering, these two concepts are actually also a little bit uh, disjoint in the sense that uh, what we always say is the person that builds the model should also be responsible for monitoring the model from a data science perspective, at least, so from a performance perspective. Uh, the, and that would be the second um, model monitoring. And then the first monitoring is the person that deploys the model. They should be responsible uh, for whether the model is still up and making predictions in a um, efficient way. And typically the person that deploys the model uh, might be labeled an ML engineer or an MLOps engineer. And the person that builds the model typically is a data scientist. But of course, in many different companies, these roles kind of overlap. So that's why we refrain uh, these days to building the model um, and deploying the model. And if you deploy the model, you need to make sure that the model is actually making predictions. And if you build the model, you need to make sure that the model is actually making the correct predictions. Um, and that brings us to the question of um, why is it important to start model monitoring right now? Um, first of all, it's uh, the future of data science, or at least that's how we see the world, is going to be post-deployment. There is lots of use cases that are getting deployed right now, and there's more and more industries that are finding their way to uh, putting machine learning models in production. And we see that in the future, we, we will hardly ever have a production environment where there is no models running at all. And it's gonna be a production environment where models are gonna be collaborating and working together and that we already start from an existing environment. Um, and how we are then gonna improve our models and, and choose our next use, use cases and choose the problems that we are gonna be, uh, be tackling next, that's all post-deployment data science. And the only way that we can do that correctly is to have a view of which models are performed, which data sources are working very well, which data sources might actually have lots of drift, drift in them, uh, which pro business processes um, might be changing a lot. So getting this post-deployment data science view is very, very important. And that's also where we see that the future of data science is heading towards. So way more focus on deployment and then actually also maintenance um, and building upon existing models or existing production systems. Um, and what should be the impact of a good monitoring system? First of all, it should instill trust uh, in the data science team and their models. And if you have a good monitoring system, then the, uh, the anecdotally expected a value that is at risk um, for your machine learning models, you should be able to safeguard that and prevent model failures. Uh, a very important thing that your model monitoring system should do is alert you when something goes wrong. And ideally at the moment of the inference time so that you as a data scientist are always the first to know when the machine learning models fail and that it's not um, the business processes or the automated systems that consume your predictions that they fail or that they have problems and then come knocking at your door with a problem, but that you already know and that you can proactively um, either um, establish communication or take preventative measures uh, or some defensive actions. Um, a good monitoring system will also save you time monitoring and resolving issues. Uh, you won't be spending a time on, on false alerts or things that actually uh, might not be a real issue. Uh, and if you can get the correct root cause, you can also find the right issue resolution mechanism. Um, and that's going to be uh, helping a lot with bringing your models um, back to their original performance or even better. And of course, if we can model our machine learning models, uh, we can we, if we can monitor our machine learning models, we can also show the impact uh, that our models have. And that's very important as well, not just for trust, but also just um, for our work and for us as data scientists to show that what we're doing, it's actually delivering value. Um, why in NEML? So um, to answer that question, actually, I think we should look at who we are as a company. Uh, and we're basically all data scientists and we're also building a product, uh, a solution, a service for data scientists. And I think that that's very important because um, we take the science first approach um, where most of our algorithms 
and and things that we've uh, invented and discovered and that we use to solve the model monitoring problem is rooted in science. Um, and we also put performance first because as data scientists, what we care about the most is actually that our models are bringing business value. And that is what we're going to be focusing on with Nanny ML and not necessarily of putting in best practices or doing what everything else is doing. No, we put model performance first and that's the thing that we care about most. Um, and that will come true, uh, through our work, to the algorithms that, that we have developed. Um, and basically, that is inside of our DNA. And that's also um, why we focus, if we look at the two types of problems that it can occur, either your model not making predictions or your model or your predictions being wrong, is that today we focus solely on the model predictions being wrong. And we leave um, the first problem where the model might not make any predictions to infrastructure monitoring. And we separate uh, the two very distinctly. And what's the biggest problem today um, with machine learning models in production? It's that actually most of them fail silently. What does that mean? That they start deteriorating, that they start making bad predictions, and that we don't necessarily know. And the reason for that is that um, not in every uh, machine learning use case, the performance can be measured or calculated. Like for instance, if we take loan default prediction where we try to predict whether a customer will cancel their loan or not um, in the next, um, who will be able to repay their loan or not in the next two years, we actually only really know at the end of the loan whether they were able to repay their loan back or not. And that during uh, the term of the loan, we actually don't have a view on the real performance and we're basically in the dark. So if we cannot measure performance, how can we then know that our models are still performing well? Um, and that is the problem of delayed ground truth. And I visualized here um, the performance metric, in this case, ROC AUC, for the case where the ground truth is instant. So this might be the situation where you go in a webshop, web shop, you get a product recommended, um, and then two seconds later, you buy that product. And then you actually instantly know whether the recommendation was correct. And in that, that case, here on the left side, this is the performance on the test set. Then we deploy the model, and then we have the performance in production. This is monthly performance. And when we're making new predictions, so at inference time, we actually almost instantly have um, the performance of that prediction. Now, then there is use cases where the ground truth is delayed, like I mentioned with the loan default uh, use case. Then at inference time, we actually will only know the real performance of uh, the predictions that for which the prediction window has already passed. So in this case, we would only know um, the predictions if this term, for instance, of this loan was six months, or if we're trying to do, to do churn prediction and we predict which customers will cancel their subscription in the next months, in the next six months, then we will only get a view at inference time of how the model was performing, the real performance, six months ago because the window that we're predicting over is still going on. And then there is also use cases where the ground truth is completely absent. And this is the case in automation use cases. For instance, if we're gonna replace um, a, a certain process that was done by humans before, for instance, we might have a credit application um, or an insurance application that used to be analyzed by analysts. And right now we build a machine learning model that kind of mimics these analysts and their assessment. and uh, we automate that process and the analysts are out of the loop, then we will actually never know what that resolution of the analyst would have been. Same for a pricing model. Um, and then our real model performance would look something like this. And we would be completely blind of how our model is performing in production. And how traditional monitoring uh, solves that problem it's basically by looking at the model inputs. And this is what we call a data-centric uh, machine learning monitoring approach, which is not bad, but it actually gives a false sense of security. And it might cause alert fatigue. So what we see here is, for instance, a feature um, when we go and look in production where there is lots of drift happening. But if we would have access to the real performance, we see that it does not affect performance. And there's many reasons why this happens, um, because univariative typically it's statistical uh, measures and they tend to be very sensitive because we repeat them over time. 
Um, there might be trends and seasonality in features, uh, which these drift detection methods actually don't really um, capture. And there can be drift actually to the feature space where the model is fairly certain. And then the model will know how to deal with these changes. And then these changes are not going to impact model performance. The way to think about it, it might be that there's unimportant features in the model. And when they change, you don't want to get an alert because the model will know how to deal with it and the performance will not be impacted. So with this type of monitoring, there's lots of false alerts because we don't know what the actual impact of the drift is. And we also don't have a view on the performance. And we came up with a solution uh, with this. Um, and we built algorithms that can quantify the impact of covariate shift, which allows us then to estimate model performance. And this is really the bread and butter of NaniML, and that's actually one of the main reasons um, to pick NaniML um, as a monitoring tool, because we go deep into the science. Um, Mafalda, maybe you can share um, our paper that we recently wrote on performance estimation, where we validated these algorithms on 600 data sets, um, and where we did lots of experiments to kind of prove how these algorithms work. One of the reasons that we actually went open source also um, is because we built these algorithms, uh, and in the beginning, four years ago, uh, when we went to market with these algorithms, lots of people were always asking, yeah, but how do they work? Um, and that was one of the main reasons why we open sourced the first algorithms, because it's a new paradigm, it's a new way of doing machine learning model monitoring. Um, and if, if data scientists can see how it worked, that um, builds lots of trust in our solution as well. And how that looks like is that if we take uh, the case where the um, target data is absent uh, for the automation use cases, what these algorithms can do is they can still create a view on the expected performance. And that way, we can kind of put model performance again front and center, even when it cannot directly measure it because the target data is delayed. Um, and that way, we can alter actually the monitoring workflow. And as opposed to doing it data centric, we can put the performance first. And then only when there is an issue with the estimated performance, we can go and delve deeper and use um, the drift detection techniques to figure out which features actually had an issue. Um, and this reduces the uh, false alerts a lot because right now we will only have to look at those cases um, or at those scenarios when the uh, expected performance has dropped underneath the performance threshold. And we'll only have to look at those features that actually also have issues at the same time when there is um, an issue with the expected performance. Um, and that's how uh, we came up with this uh, performance first uh, ML monitoring workflow. Um, first of all, it's because model performance um, is the most important thing, um, but also because we've um, developed these algorithms that can, can estimate performance, that we can focus on the performance first, uh, and then when there is a performance degradation, it's only then that we go into the root cause mode where we will use um, the covariate shift detection, the multivariate data drift detection, the concept shift detection, data quality issue detection algorithms to come up with an actual root cause uh, and not as an alerting mechanism to send alerts, just to figure out what went wrong. And then when we've established the issue that was the underlying root cause for the performance, we can then go into resolving this issue, retraining the model, refactoring the use case, maybe reweighing certain examples, falling back on a previous model. And it's really this workflow that allows um, data scientists to be more efficient with their model monitoring. Um, Let's uh, then right now delve into, before I go in, and do the walkthroughs of both uh, the open source and the clouds, let's dive a little bit deeper into um, NaniML open source and NaniML cloud themselves. Um, so what's inside of the open source? It's basically two things. It's the basic monitoring algorithms, um, or at least the, the, the first versions of the monitoring algorithms, um, and some interactive visualizations. And this library follows like the scikit-learn paradigm where we fit our monitoring algorithm on a reference data. This is typically the test set. 
and where we then predict or estimate performance on the analysis data or the production data. And that's it. Um, and when we developed um, the open source library, um, of course, it was great that right now there are these algorithms that can uh, kind of give a view on the performance when there is no target data. But to deploy these algorithms and to put them in a full-blown monitoring solution, there's still lots of work to be done. Uh, so we have gotten lots of questions about, okay, but how can we collect data? How do we best store it? What's the most efficient way to run these algorithms? And that's how we kind of put together our cloud offering is that we solved all of the issues that come along um, with open source. And so that means that today in the cloud, we have more and better algorithms than inside of the open source. And that's one of the main value propositions. And another thing is that we actually take care of all of the infrastructure and the engineering around a full-blown monitoring system. So that means that there's programmatic data collection that can collect predictions and model inputs in production, sent them um, to, the, to the instance that does um, efficient metric computation and storage. Then there's customizable dashboards, interactive visualizations. And then um, we basically combine all of the monitoring algorithms together to send automated and intelligent and also customizable alerts, which you can receive either via Slack or email notifications. And then there's also the possibility um, from within the monitoring solution to trigger other um, applications, for instance, retraining pipeline, um, or maybe send some data to, to another dashboard for business stakeholders. Um, and then there's a third point is that after collaborating with lots of uh, different data scientists, we've also um, worked on use case and industry specific solutions. Because um, at the end of the day, it's just what we do in data science as well. There is lots of algorithms, but the real key is to tweak those algorithms specific for the machine learning use case. And it's the same for monitoring. So for instance, we worked on a module for uh, demand forecasting models where there is parallel model support because uh, often in these use cases, a single model for a different product category or for a different product is being trained. And then it's about aggregating all of these models together um, so that there can be one single um, uh, aggregated uh, model performance for all these different models. And that um, you can actually then drill down in which models are underperformant. And we've also, uh, for instance, worked together um, with um, some people in the manufacturing industry to build uh, a probabilistic model evaluation framework where um, we answer the question uh, where you roll out a use case post-deployment where you have, for instance, a pilot on a certain machine or in a certain factory, and you wanna get some guarantees or you wanna know if, this, if we scale this up that we can have certain product quality or that we can actually uh, hits a certain performance, and we put tooling around that uh, as well, which is also very helpful to do post-deployment uh, champion challenger uh, model setup or some A-B testing. Um, and to quickly talk about the NaniML application itself and how that um, then um, all of these things come together. So basically, we're available on the cloud marketplace, and it's completely self-service. Um, it takes around 15 to 30 minutes to deploy a NaniML instance inside of your cloud environment. So this is very important uh, because lots of data scientists work with very sensitive data. So there is no data being sent to NaniML. Uh, on the contrary, we decided to bring our application to you um, via the cloud marketplace. So if you subscribe uh, to this application, um, all of this, which runs uh, underneath in Kubernetes, is going to be running inside of your cloud environment so that there is no data leaving your cloud. And how that then works is that via the SDK, we collect the model input and the model output. Um, the test set is necessary to configure um, NaniML so that um, all of the algorithms can be calibrated. And then it's also possible to send some business KPIs or the target data when it's available. That gets sent to the managed application uh, via the Python SDK, which basically does the compute and the metric storage. And then all of these results get sent to a dashboard. And depending on what the underlying issues are, there might be some automated alerts that are being sent uh, to other users or automated triggers to other systems, like for instance, an automated retraining pipeline. Um, 
So I already mentioned that the cloud versus the open source, it's basically um, more and better algorithms. Um, it takes care of the infrastructure and the engineering. And then there is this industry and use case specific solutions. And two of our most powerful algorithms, we decided to not open source them. Uh, we did write already a paper about one of these algorithms because we do have the, the open, science, open science philosophy here at Nanimal where we try to share as much of the things with other data scientists that we learn. Um, and these algorithms are very powerful. One is to detect concept shifts. Uh, and then this is basically an improved version of the open source algorithm to do performance estimation. But I'll show in a second uh, how these algorithms work um, when I do the walkthroughs. I'm going to quickly stop sharing and then share my screen again. And then we can have a look at the NaniML open source library. So I've already installed, uh, pip installed NaniML. And the main thing or the easiest or the fastest value with the library is to do retroactive monitoring. So that's basically answering the question, how has a model been performing in the past six months or in the past three months? And what we're gonna do for that is we're gonna read in two data sets. Uh, one is the reference data and the other one is the analysis data set. Uh, the analysis data is basically all the production data that becomes available after a model has been deployed in production. And the reference data set is the test set. Uh, and we use the test set as a reference, as a golden data set to calibrate our algorithms, to extract um, our distributions from, and to also establish a baseline model performance. And we typically use the test sets for this because it's very important that this data is unseen for the model because uh, we also train our monitoring algorithms. And if this data is already being seen by the model, there might be some slight overfitting going on. But it's also possible uh, when you deploy a model in production, if you do some type of high alert phase where you stay very close to the model for the first 10 to 15 um, days or where you really keep close track, and then you can establish that as um, a baseline for, um, a, for, for calibrating uh, and using it as a reference. And we can see here, so there's a bunch of features. This is a Kaggle data set where we're gonna try and predict which customer, so every line is a customer, will cancel their booking in the next three months. And since this is the test set, we also have the target, whether they actually canceled their booking or not, um, and then also the model output. And that's all we need. So we don't need any um, model files or, or anything like that. Basically all of the information that we need for um, making our algorithms works is encoded in the test set because we also have the model predictions. And then when we look at the analysis data, it's just the model inputs and the model outputs, but we don't have access to the target because um, the target data only occurs uh, after those um, six months when we actually know whether the customer ended up canceling their booking or not. So the first thing to do is we're gonna estimate the model performance. And how this works is we kind of follow, like I said, the scikit-learn paradigm, um, where we we take one of our uh, performance estimation algorithms. We have to quickly tell NaniMLK which column contains the model output, which column contains the predictions, uh, and what is the granularity of the monitoring analysis. So for that, we need a timestamp column, and we need to say, okay, I want the monitoring analysis to happen monthly, and I pick a main performance metric. And what we then gonna do is fit it on the reference or on the test set and then estimate for the production data. And if I run this, then we should be able to see uh, what are expected uh, accuracies for this specific use case in production. So here we see on the reference data, we see the performance on the test set uh, for the months that were used for testing. And then when we deploy the machine learning model here, um, we see what happens with the expected performance over time. And we see here that in the last few months, the expected performance drops underneath this threshold. So this will probably warrant some investigation. Um, and then we can also run as part of the in investigation or the root cause analysis, run multivariate data drift, kind of follows the same paradigm where we fit on the reference data. Um, but this time we're just gonna look at all the features together um, and then see whether the underlying data structure changes in production. And we can see that indeed here, when there was an issue with the model performance, it's also uh, captured in the multivariate data drift. 
And then the next step would be to find out, okay, which features were exactly um, causing troubles. And what we can see here, is I already isolated um, one feature and then I also isolated uh, the model output because we can look at that as well from a univariate drift perspective. And we can see that we see lots of drift here with the lead time and that we can also see some drift here uh, for the model output. And then uh, when the actual performance or the actual target data becomes available, what we can do is we can read in this target data. And then um, there's two things that we can calculate. We can calculate uh, the real performance going to do that first. Um, and then we can actually see what the actual accuracy is after those six months have gone over um, and we get our target data. But we can also compare them real quickly with how good we were at estimating this model performance. And we can see here that we were actually quite close um, with how the model actually ended up performing. But the big difference is that we would have a view on this expected performance at the moment that we make our inferences. So in this case, we would know the six months before um, compared to the realized performance. And that allows us to act way faster and to resolve any of uh, the model performance issues that might have occurred in production. Um, so this was a quick walkthrough of the open source. The main takeaway point is that um, we need a reference and analysis. Um, that it's basically fitting on the reference, predicting on the analysis. We need to provide some small type of mapping um, and that we get an interactive visualization. And that typically the easiest way to use an NML or the fastest way to use an NML open source without having to do too much engineering is to retroactively monitor a machine learning model. Um, that means when a machine learning model is already running in production, we get the reference data, the analysis data, uh, and we answer the question, how has this model been performing over the past six months? And typically, uh, that's the fastest way to get value out of an email. Of course, it's also possible to completely integrate um, and deploy the open source as part of your prediction pipelines or as part of your monitoring pipelines. But that's going to take some engineering effort. And it's this engineering and infrastructure effort that we have already taken care of um, with the NaniML cloud offering. And I'll quickly walk you through that as well. Uh, so we're available on the cloud marketplace, um, um, both on AWS and on Azure. Um, and we're available as a managed application. And like I said before, um, you can just subscribe here. All of our plans come with a mo one month free trial that you can uh, completely try out everything and see whether um, NaniML is a fit for, the, for the, your use cases that you have running in production. And how this basically works takes around uh, 15 minutes again, uh, where you quickly configure uh, some things. Um, and what uh, one of the nice things here is the just-in-time uh, uh, access, actually, because Azure is managing this application, is managing the infrastructure inside of your cloud environment. But if there is an underlying issue, what's possible is to give us access um, when there is an issue that occurs, and then we can have a look one of our engineers can have a look at the lower level logs, and then we can instantly resolve your issue and push a new version without us actually having um, any of um, access or without you having to send us any data. And that's uh, very, very powerful. And that's why this is actually also such a great uh, way of deploying, because that means that the software gets brought to you inside of your cloud and that there's no data being sent to us and that we do not process any data. Um, and if you launch an instance like this, what you will get um, is something like this, where I already added a lot of um, Kaggle data sets. Um, and, but before I will explain this, I will quickly show how to add some more. Um, so this is our, uh, we're going to import our Python SDK, and we're quickly going to connect to the instance. Um, and then there's three types of monitoring that I'm going to demonstrate here. One is the retroactive monitoring that uh, we can also technically do with the open source. Um, the other one is the continuous monitoring, which is going to be answering the question, okay, how is the model performing right now? And then we're going to do some monitoring when the target data or the ground truth becomes available. Uh, and I'm going to send the same data um, to NaniML as before. So this is, again, the same Kaggle data set. And uh, there's no customer data yet, uh, no target data yet. 
because we're predicting whether people will cancel their booking. So we'll have to wait for that a little bit more. Um, we can, first thing we need to do is set up the model schema. So the same type of mapping as before, which column contains the prediction, which column contains the timestamp, um, what type of problem is it? And then when we create the model or when we add the model to NannyML, we also need to specify, okay, what's the granularity of the monitoring analysis and what's the main performance metric? Uh, and as we can see, I'm gonna refresh here, there's gonna be a new model here that's being added and for which we're crunching some information. Um, and while this is running, um, I'm gonna quickly explain this uh, model overview where we can see that there's already like lots of models in production. And you can clearly see here the main value proposition of NaniML Cloud, which is of course, that you get a view of all of your models in production and how they are performing, but also that in lots of these use cases, the target data is delayed and the real performance cannot be measured. And that's where, where our algorithms come into play, where we can then actually estimate the model performance so that we can get an idea of what the expected performance is, even though there is no target data yet. And this comes with the side benefit that I mentioned earlier, that, uh, for here, when this estimated performance is in green, we don't actually have to go and look at the covariate shift because we know, because we can quantify the impact of the covariate shift, that all of these covariate alerts, um, when there is red, there is an issue with the data, changes in the data basically, um, for various reasons, like I said before, it might be the seasonality or the trends or just the statistical test being very sensitive, unimportant features that drift or actually changes in the data that the model knows how to deal with. And then these typically are all false alerts, except this one, because here we do see that there is a problem uh, with the estimated performance. Uh, and when that's the case, then this is probably actually uh, a data drift alert that we might want to investigate. I think in the meantime, um, here our, our um, first run has been executed and we can see I send a little bit less data to kind of give you an idea of how it would look like when the model is really in production. So this is the, the real performance. Um, and of course, this is the moment that the model got deployed and in production, we don't have any data yet because there's no target data. So that's when this algorithm comes into place where we estimate model performance. And this algorithm here, it's one of our improved algorithms that is way more accurate at estimating model performance than the algorithm that is in the open source. Uh, and you can have a look at our paper where we kind of compare these algorithms and benchmark them. But we can see here in production that there is no performance issue yet because the expected performance falls between these two performance thresholds that are being extracted based on the expected performance of the test sets. So right now there is no issue. We wouldn't get an automated alert. We wouldn't get an uh, and we won't have to delve in deeper to do any type of investigation because the model expected performance is within uh, the performance bounds. Then I'm gonna send a little bit more data, uh, which is very easy. We just need to get um, the model uh, that we want to add more data to and then uh, collect new inferences. I'm gonna send one, one month of extra data uh, and then we need to send these new inferences to NaniML. We can either send them as batch, where we send lots of inferences uh, at the same time, lots of predictions, or uh, we can send them one at a time. And then we trigger a monitoring run uh, based on what type of granularity we want from a business perspective. So it doesn't necessarily make sense to trigger a new monitoring run after every time you send um, a single prediction because it's most likely not going to impact your aggregated model performance, which might be monthly, daily, or even hourly. And then we can see, I'm going to refresh this real quick, that Nanima already finished the run, but right now we have an extra month of data here, and we can see that right now there is an uh, um, issue detected with the expected performance. So you really put this uh, performance at front and center, but that doesn't mean that we're so dogmatic about it that you cannot receive any other alerts on maybe any other of the drift detection methods. So you can just create a card here and then also get alerted on maybe a univariate drift alert or anything that you know from a business perspective that might impact uh, or might have a negative impact on your model. Um, so we're going to have a quick look. So right now we established that there is a performance issue um, and then we're going to have a look. Um, we're going to start our root cause analysis and we're going to have a look first at the other 
performance metrics that we might be interested in. And one of them is business value. And this is actually a very interesting one because what we can do is we can, in the model settings, configure a cost benefit matrix where we can tell, okay, if we make a correct prediction, then this is how much money we would make. And if we make um, a false prediction or a false positive, then there's some type of opportunity cost that occurs and that's how much money we would lose. And we can connect this cost benefit matrix to our expected performance. And then we can express our expected performance in business value. So in a dollar amount. And typically this is the thing that you would also communicate to business stakeholders or to anyone else, because it's very easy to interpret. Basically, if your model drops underneath this line, we're losing money or uh, where the models are not making that much money as before. And we can even see here that already in this month, from a monetary perspective, it would be considered a performance issue. Um, and then we can use our other tools to delve in deeper and to come up with the root cause of why this model has deteriorated. We can do concept shift detection yet because there's no target data. So we'll start with a covariate shift detection. And for that, we have multivariate data drift detection. And we can see here, uh, again, that there's lots of multivariate data drift happening in this month that there is an issue. Um, and after that's established, then we can just um, pick a distance metric or a statistical measure to delve in deeper. And we can see that there is like lots of uh, features in this data set. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, only show me those features that have an alert when there is an actual um, issue with the performance. Uh, and that way we filter down those data drifts alerts that are relevant to the performance issue. And then we can have a look at the distributions as well. Um, and since we don't really know these features, it might even be better to actually have a look at um, the averages instead. And then we can see here that for instance, the lead time, it has gone down uh, here for the past two months. Uh, so this is a time to make a booking. We see that the repeated guests also have gone up um, and that the previous cancellations also have gone up. And if we then quickly take our model outputs, we can see that that is what has led to the model outputting higher probabilities to cancel, which kind of makes sense. There is uh, more repeated customers that make decisions faster who are known to cancel a booking. Um, and that's here why our model performance has deteriorated. But this type of root cause analysis, it's very important that this is being done by the person that understands the data, ideally also has built the model, but at least understands the business context in which the model is operating. And this root, root cause analysis is semi-automated and it often still requires a human in the loop to really connect the dots. There's also small data quality uh, module. And here we can do the same thing. So we want to all of the issues that uh, coincide with the drop in performance. And of course, we don't have um, any target data in production yet. So this target data is missing. But we can also see for country that there is a few new countries here that occurred. So there's unseen values. And that means that uh, during testing these countries, it was not possible to make bookings from yet or bookings to. Um, and that in production, these countries appeared. So it might also be that the model does not necessarily know how to generalize to these new countries well. And that's why there's also an alert for this. And then I'm quickly going to show um, the same thing as I did before when the target data is available and then we can um, send over the target data as well where NaniML will automatically connect this target data uh, to the model output. Um, let me refresh and then um, it's going to take a second to run. I've actually not just sent um, the target data but also sent three more months of production data just so we can get a better view um on how performance um our 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 on how performant our performance estimation algorithms are when we use all of the all of the production data um this is going to take a second to run and one of the one of the the powerful things inside of the cloud product is that as you send more data or as this is all running consecutively that all these calculations are done efficiently uh, and that we don't are actually wasting any compute on rerunning, for instance, these calculations when they were already done last month. And also when calculations come in partially, uh, for instance, first few days of the month, we can already get 
um, an idea of what the uh, what the performance is going to be here, and then it will automatically automatically update as more information comes in. And this typically also impacts the confidence bounds. Um, as more data occurs in a chunk, uh, we're going to be more and more certain about our projections or about the estimated performance, and then the confidence band is going to become less. Um, and what we can do right now is quickly compare actually um, both the realized and the estimated performance since we right now um, have the target data. And we can see how close we were in this case, of course, same data as before, at estimating the model performance. Um, big difference here is that we, and also for the business value metric actually, a uh, big difference is here is that we would already know when there is a, a model performance issue at inference time. Um, and this means that we can already take some defensive actions or some corrective actions um, before the predictions have negative downstream business impact. And this will also guarantee that as a data scientist, you're always the first to know when there is a potential uh, performance issue going on, because as soon as you make the predictions, you can get a view on the expected performance. And that is really truly the main uh, value proposition of NannyML. And since right now we also have target data, what we can do is concept shift detection as well. Um, and the concept shift detection here is expressed as an, the, the impact it has on accuracy. So it's a delta. And we can see here that during um, the testing, the concept is very stable. And that in production, the concept kind of follows the same stability and also fall, falls within these two uh, performance thresholds. So we can already rule out that concept shift is one of the root causes for the model to fail in production. Um, and having that information, we can of course take a more appropriate remediation action to improve model performance again. <clears throat> if there was concept shift detection, one of the things that we could do is to um, with the webhook is to uh, trigger a retraining pipeline because when there's new patterns emerge, emerging in production or old patterns become uh, obsolete, that means that retraining actually is probably going to improve the model. Um, but when there is no concept drift, it probably um, requires something else to deal with these issues or deeper um, data science work to try and improve um, the model. And that's it uh, for, for the quick walkthrough of uh, the NannyML clouds. Uh, so maybe to, to highlight again what the difference is with the open source. So in the open source, we have lots of uh, data drift detection algorithms and performance estimation algorithms. Uh, in the cloud, we have better versions of these. Um, on average, our algorithms in the clouds are between 10 and 30% more accurate uh, at estimating performance. And then of course, uh, it's way easier to integrate NannyML clouds uh, inside of your production environment. And um, things like the Python SDK for automated uh, data collection are going to be very useful. And then we can get a view of all of our models in production. Um, and um, lots of the infrastructure and then the engineering part there is uh, being handled um, about NannyML and uh, by NannyML. Um, and of course, one of the biggest advantages, I think as well, specifically from data science perspective, if we're working on very sensitive data, is that this can be deployed inside of your cloud environment. And there is no need to worry about data being sent to a third uh, party provider or anything like that, because everything is being processed on your own resources. <clears throat>